Well, it is a pleasure to be back with you all this morning. Um, technology aside, it's, it is fantastic to see how, how this body has, has grown over the last couple of years since the last time I was here. This is, this is awesome, and I hear there's a number of people who are away today. So praise the Lord. I love to, love to see how the church has grown, and it's been nice to catch up with a few of you all. Um, but as we look at, at, at Psalm 80 this morning, I want to look at the idea of lamentation, specifically lamentation as we come into a new year, as we look at everything that's happening in our, our cultural moment that we are a part of, what's going on in the United States, even the world abroad, uh, and just kind of use this as a lens through which we can then, you, you have the, the sermon title there in front of you, Restore Us, O God, A New Year's Lamentation of Hope to kind of use Asaph's, Asaph's prayer here in Psalm 80 as, as a maxim for how we ought to lament in hope. And not too many people think of lamentation and hope as going hand in hand, but biblical lamentation must be wedded with a strong hope. And I want to lay that out through Psalm 80 this morning, but... As, as we think about lamentation, in our darkest hours when we pray, in our darkest, deepest times of grief, we pray for that which we hope for most. Just as human beings, that's how we're built, that's how we're created. Our prayers, both in their, their content and their attitude, reveal our true hopes and expectations. They reveal where our, our trust lies. When we look at our, our culture, our national identity today, what mo motivates you to pray? What are you motivated to pray for as you look around at the culture and the way that it's headed today? The U.S. was once described as a Christian nation. I don't think anyone can honestly say that's the truth anymore. I can't. Not, not looking around at everything that's going on. But as, as this once great nation that was founded on, on the, these constitutional ideals of God's law, biblical morality, as it's slipping into depravity and ruin, we need to recognize this. It's the very definition of Romans 1, where Paul says that, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their, ex in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. We live in a cultural moment where the United States, Western culture, has exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of corruptible man, of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And so God has given over this culture. Given the culture of the United States, of the Western nations, over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer in a new year, but happy new year. Um, how should we respond to such a cultural moment as this? Lamentation. We're not in the cultural moment that Jeremiah was as he sits and watches the Babylonians leveling Jerusalem and lamenting that for the United States. The government still stands. We still have our homes and our properties. We're not being carted off, man, woman, child, fathers being beheaded and assassinated by a foreign nation. We're not being carried off into captivity. But our culture has been plundered. This is a cultural moment that is worth lamenting deep, sad grief. But how do we lament? That is definitional. That must be unique. 
for us as believers. We need to lament with a fervent messianic hope. And that's what Asaph is laying out in Psalm 80. He has a fervent messianic hope. The judgment that is coming on this nation, on Western nations for sin, is severe. We know this from Scripture and how God has leveled nations. Nations rise, nations fall. It's all at the hand of God and his providence. But here in Psalm 80, Asaph is showing us how to balance lamentation with a fervent messianic hope. And he lays that out with four descriptions of God that transform our despair into hopeful lamentation. Four descriptions of God that transform our despair into hopeful lamentation lamentation because lamentation without hope is just utter despair these four descriptions not only transform despair into hopeful lamentation they also prime and prepare our hearts for the coming of the messiah for asaph in the old testament saint saint it was the preparation of their hearts for the coming of jesus and his first advent and for us now in our cultural moment, it's looking even further to the second advent. So while Psalm 80 isn't necessarily a messianic prophecy, it is Asaph's desperate yet very hopeful pleading for the Messiah to come. You can read this throughout all of this. You see the shepherd motif that he uses that crosses over into the New Testament as well. And we'll touch on that here in a minute. You see God as judge there in the second paragraph as well. This psalm, perhaps more than any other, invokes or alludes to or directly cites more scripture than most, if not any other psalm. It's pretty unique. When scripture is quoting scripture, we see that a lot in the New Testament. How often do you see it in the Old Testament, let alone a psalm, where a psalmist is writing a song to be sung in worship, but he's quoting previous scripture. This is pretty unique for Asaph to be doing this. The first description he gives is God as shepherd. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel. There's a number of different places in the Old Testament, where God is described as a shepherd. It's, it's a theme that follows from Genesis all the way into Revelation, where God is described as shepherd. It's this recognition of, of Yahweh's shepherd-like character that motivates Asaph to cry out for relief and restoration in what ought to be understood as a desperate plea for the Messiah. What more intimate and, and comforting description could he use than to call Yahweh shepherd? Think of what an Old Testament shepherd was. Think Psalm 23. Jacob describes Yahweh as his shepherd in Genesis 48. But when we look at Psalm chapter 23, the first three verses, how comforting. Is that to our souls to read that Yahweh is my shepherd? I shall not want. Asaph is pulling from David to be able to say, Lament, be grievous, but hope. This is the one that we are praying to, the one we are pleading with for the coming of the Messiah. The one who is our shepherd provides all our needs. He then, this, this motif then continues on in Isaiah, in chapter 40. And we'll read that uh, all the way at the end this morning. But he, he describes God as this loving shepherd that holds on to his people, a gentle shepherd. But how is he praying? He's pleading for the shepherd to give ear. They're in the middle of a cultural moment for Israel where... They're being lambasted by a foreign enemy. He doesn't say who they are. It could be the Babylonians. It could be the Philistines. It could be a number of anybody, any 
foreign nations who hate Israel throughout their history. But Asaph doesn't give us any indication as to who it is. All we know is this is a cultural moment where Israel is being punished for something. They're being disciplined for some sin. And that's stark because sin is nowhere mentioned in this passage. When you read Psalm 80, nowhere does Asaph say, we sinned against you, therefore you disciplined us. But there's something that Asaph has clear in his head. That the people, the nation, deserves what they have now in their cultural moment. And his lamentation is built on this. To cry out to the shepherd of Israel, the one who leads Joseph like a His hope goes even further than that here in describing the shepherd of Israel. There at verse 1 again. You who are enthroned above the cherubim shine forth. What does that call back to mind? This is Isaiah 6. This is Isaiah 40 verse 5. This is Asaph screaming out, in pleading agony for the hope of Yahweh's glory to be revealed. Send the Messiah. We need him. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why we're being punished. Restore us. Send Messiah. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, before all of your people, stir up your power and come to save us. And that phrase there at the end of verse 2, come to save us. That is the verbal, the verbal root from which we get Jesus' name. Yeshua. He is very clearly running to the hope the fervent expectation of a messianic hope in the midst of his grief. The sheep are in desperate need of their shepherd's help, his protection. And so you see his refrain there in verse 3 that is repeated two more times. He says, oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. Such a mighty, messianic hope packed into those phrases. There's only one who could restore Israel. There's only one who could apply the balm to that deep grief that Asaph has over his nation and people, and it is God. Note that this is also a very clear citation of the Aaronic blessing, the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6. He's asking for that favor of the Lord. In number 6, this concept of divine favor is expressed by the image of one's face shining on another, like a beaming countenance of approval. And Asaph is pulling this from number 625, from the middle of the Aaronic blessing. He's invoking Yahweh's name in blessing the people of Israel, pleading for grace and peace. And if you trace the use of that theme, and you trace the use of that quotation, you can go in, into Psalm 1. And in Psalm 1 verse 6 the, the psalmist picks up that concept of divine favor and blessing where the righteous and the wicked are contrasted against one another. Yahweh's stance toward the righteous is he knows the way of the righteous. But what happens to the way of the wicked? It will perish. And then in Psalm 4, David himself picks up the priestly blessing, saying, Who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Yahweh. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and new wine abound. 
In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Asaph is looking at what scripture is saying will bring peace and blessing and mercy. And that is the invocation of Yahweh's blessing. He knows there is only one place for restoration. And he has one purpose for this invocation. That last phrase, and we will be saved in verse 3. Oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us. Depending on your, your translation that you're using, it may even say that we might be saved or that we will be saved. It's a purpose statement. Cause your face to shine upon us so that we will be saved. The purpose of divine favor is a restoration, a redemption from this discipline, this punishment, this situation that they find themselves in. Asaph moves on then and, and describes God as judge. He begins there in, in hope with God as shepherd and moves into verses 4 through 7, describing God as judge, lest his readers, lest his listeners think that God is not being a good shepherd, he moves into God as judge where he shows that the discipline of God on his people, though vivid, is just. Look what he says. How long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? Hebrew is very vivid in that. Is how long, if you're using the Legacy Standard Bible, they translate it as smolder. Think of a bonfire. The flames have dawned, died down, and all you've got is just the smoldering coals, and you've got to pour water on it. And every time you pour some water on it, the coals start to pop and to sizzle, and smoke plumes up. They're angry coals. They don't want to be put out. This, this is the picture of the smoldering wrath against the prayer of God's people. Why would God be angry with the prayers of his people? When God's people are in sin, he smolders in wrath against their prayers. Their hypocritical oaths. Look at Psalm 51 with me. In Psalm 51, verses 14 through 17, David says this, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. David recognizes that a hypocritical sacrifice to absolve himself of his sin with Bathsheba would result only more punishment, only more discipline, because that is not what pleases God. The sacrificial system was not set up to be, oh, I send, go kill another sheep, pour its blood out on an altar and burn it to a crisp, and I'll be absolved of this sin, and I'll go do the same thing tomorrow. David recognizes that's not what this is about. This is about being a broken, contrite sinner before a holy, just God. Asaph is using that same language to describe how God is standing, listening to the prayers of his people coming to him. Isaiah describes a similar situation for the nation as a whole in Isaiah chapter 1, where Israel's utilization of that sacrificial system had become just a hypocritical balm for their seared consciences. In the same way that so many today profess 
the name of Christ, but only serve him in lip service or uh, bare minimum attendance on Christmas and Easter or pay a verbal homage to him in a, a moralistic therapeutic deism in, in the meantime, denying his sufficiency, his authority, his word, the efficacy of him and his spirit in their lives to guide and direct them. So he is just in his punishment of those who are hypocritical. The result of this hypocrisy is discipline. And the grief in this discipline is described in verse 5. You have fed them with the bread of tears and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. The tears and the weeping and the grief of the people is such that that is their food. Their sustenance is their tears. Rather than being filled with bread and water, the picture is that of somebody gluttonously filling themselves with tears. Israel has fallen into a deep and bitter grief. And not only this, but there's a national ridicule as well. Not only is there a grieving across the nation, but there is a national ridicule from the nations around them. When we look at Ezekiel chapter 5, Ezekiel 5.5, 5, God says, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, this is Jerusalem. I have set her at the center of the nations with lands around her. But she has rebelled against my ordinances more wickedly than the nations and against my statutes more than the lands which surround her. For they have rejected my ordinances and have not walked in my statutes. Israel's purpose for existing was to be a light in the center of the nations. Richie touched on this this morning in Sunday school. Israel was at a juncture in the world. The major powers had to cross her land to go anywhere else. If Assyria wanted to invade Egypt, they had to cross through Canaan. They had to go through Israel. If Egypt wanted to invade another territory, they had to go through Israel. Tiny little spit of land, but it controlled such a massive, prominent place on the world stage. And that is why God placed her there. That she would be that light of his righteousness to the nations. But she rebelled. She fell. Not only did she fall, but what does Yahweh say in Ezekiel 5? She fell more wickedly than the pagan nations around her. How would you like that as a description? You've been chosen for a specific righteous purpose to be a light to these people around you. That the hope of the Messiah, redemption will be accomplished through him. But your entire purpose is thwarted because you've become more wicked than the ones you're supposed to be proclaiming the gospel to. She sat at the center of the nations, meant to be a shining beacon of righteousness and hope to a sinful world, and she rebelled. And so God had to discipline her. There's something important for us to realize here today, in America even, that God will never sacrifice his righteousness and his justice merely because we claim his name. Just because we profess the name of Christ, he does not met out discipline based on a profession. It is based on the life and the contriteness of the heart and the stance that is taken in a life of worship, trust, and faith in Christ Jesus. If his people whom he has chosen and set aside rebel, he will use them to shine forth his light no matter what. He is always faithful to do what he has planned to do with his people. Sometimes the light of God's righteousness is the burning and sacking 
of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem fell and the people of Israel were taken captive, that stood in stark contrast to so much else that they were supposed to be. But that was still God's faithfulness. That was still a light to the nations around that this holy, just God would discipline his children. We may have begun as a, a quote-unquote Christian nation here in the United States. We're not there anymore. But our response ought to be a deep grief. We ought to let this spur us to an evangelistic fervor. Not for the sake of the nation as the nation, but for the people. The commission that we have in Matthew 28 we have to let this, this lamentation fill us up with a fervent messianic hope that pushes us to evangelize those around us. Whether that's a, a, a cultural shift, your co-workers, even the person sitting next to you in the chair here this morning, our call is to be evangelistically fervent with a messianic hope. Even in the midst of of such a situation as we are in now. If we don't step up to the plate, if we don't do this, we've failed our mandate as believers. We're no better than Israel at the center of the nations rebelling against God. Never let your Christianity or your membership in a church or an organization be the excuse of I've done my part. We have the call to disciple nations. If we fail in this, the next light will be us in flames. We don't have any hope outside of the proclamation of the gospel. Notice then, back in Psalm 80, Asaph's again repeated refrain in verse 7, O God of hosts, restore us, and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Beseeching God as a just judge, having pleaded in, in prayer for restoration from God the shepherd and, and judge, Asaph then moves on to address God as the founder of the nation of Israel. In verses 8 through 13, God the founder. And here we see another, another theme that, that goes through all of Scripture. The picture of Israel as a vine. In verse 8, you removed a vine from Egypt. In Old Testament times, the vine was a picture of, of personal property, being able to, to have shelter. Think of Jonah with, with the plant. It was a, a, a sign of being able to provide for someone. It was a crop, a harvest. It was survival. It marked something as individually owned or personally cared for as a possession and crop. And so when the vines are destroyed, the, the vineyards are rampaged and plundered. There was a personal loss of property and means of production and survival was removed. So when Yahweh likens Israel to a vine, when Asaph here in Psalm 80 likens Israel to a vine, understand he's using personal clear language that marks out Israel as Yahweh's own possession. A vine which he transplanted, which he cared for, which he watered, which he looked to for the production of his own crop. But when the production, the harvest of the wine was only waste, only useless, he removed his protection from around the vine and allowed it to be torn down. If you've ever planted a garden, 
growing up, my dad always had gardens. I was forced to work the garden. In Virginia, the whitetail would destroy it, probably have some of the same problems down here. And so we'd have a fence up around the corn, around the green beans, to keep the deer from being able to get at the produce. What happens when none of the plants, no matter how well they're cared for, tended, or otherwise, produce anything? They're useless. They're cut down. The deer can come in and eat them all. That is the picture of Israel. It's a wasted, useless vine. Israel's purpose was meant to produce worship and worshipers of God. But she failed in that mandate. Asaph is, is in verses 8 through 13, laying out Israel's history. You removed a vine from Egypt. Israel was redeemed by God who then drove out the nations from Canaan and planted them there in the, in the land of promise. He cleared the ground before them. And they took the root, they took root and filled the land. They expanded. For a while they fulfilled their national mandate. But what happened? Look at Deuteronomy 6 with me briefly. God himself, as he was giving the law to Moses, warned Israel of what they would have to beware of. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 10. Yahweh says this, Then it shall come about when Yahweh your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Beware, then watch yourself, that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Israel forgot where she came from. She forgot the one who transplanted her. And this vine motif, this vine theme continues throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah picks it up in Isaiah chapter 5 and describes Israel as a useless, sour grape, wild grapevine. Jesus picks it up and uses it in his parable in Luke 20 in the parable of the vineyard dressers. But then he even takes it in a different direction in John chapter 15. And turn over there with me. In John chapter 15 where Jesus describes himself as the vine. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. the vine motif through the Old Testament into the New Testament foreshadows Jesus as that vine 
who will fulfill the mandate that the vine was meant to fulfill. He will be, he will be the shoot from the stump of Jesse that will fulfill the mandate that the nation of Israel failed to fulfill. And he is who Asaph is, is foreshadowing as the vine. What we have to ask ourselves this morning is, what fruit are we producing? In your life this morning, in your life tomorrow, what you did yesterday, what fruit are you producing? Are you abiding in Christ and him in you so that your fruit is plentiful and not sour? Think again about John 15. That is also the passage where he says, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. It's a direct correlation between the bearing of fruit and the love for the church. Where Asaph may not have had this in mind, we need to keep in mind that our vine, the fulfillment of Asaph's vine, is Jesus Christ. Are you abiding in him? One of the key ways to know that is, do you have love for the person sitting next to you? Are you sacrificially living to serve the people around you that are present here this morning? One final note on this stanza, what's missing? The refrain. Where's the refrain? Asaph has, has desperately cried out to God, the shepherd, the judge, the founder of Israel for restoration. And his pleas now reach a feverish climax as he cries out to God, the restorer. And so this last stanza almost acts as the final refrain of that third stanza. He comes down to this final desperate plea for the coming of the Messiah, the only one through whom true restoration can come. And he's reaching this desperate, feverish pitch in this, in, in this stanza. He's seen his nation, which was once great and prosperous, now torn apart by foreign invaders and armies. He's desperate for the national restoration of his people under the reign of the anointed seed of David. He says, O oh God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, even the shoot which your right hand has planted, and on the son whom you have strengthened for yourself. Asaph is saying, you are a holy, just God. You are faithful. I know you will restore your people. Do it now. He's looking ahead to the only way that that can happen, and that is through the redemption in the Messiah, the anointed one from David. And he's grieving as he looks at the nation that has been burned with fire, a vine that has been cut down, a nation that has perished because of the rebuke of God. But he does not end in grief. He does not let his grief stop there. Verse 16, it is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. But where does he immediately go? Where does Esau immediately go? His lamentation does not remain utter despair. It transforms into a fervent call for messianic hope. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. 
notice that with each use of that refrain, he's added an element to it. He starts in verse 3 with, O oh God, restore us. In verse 7, O oh God of hosts, restore us. In verse 19, O oh Yahweh, God of hosts, restore us. He's becoming more and more fervent, more earnest in his plea for a restoration and redemption of the people of Israel. His hope is increasing. His earnestness, his pleas are abounding. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. He knows where his hope is. And he's calling for God's favor upon his children. So as we come to the end of Psalm 80, a few things just to consider. When you are grieving, when you are lamenting in life situations, whatever it may be, what do the content and attitude of your prayers reveal about your messianic expectation for the future? Do you have the hope that Jesus will come again and make all things new? Beloved, if you are in Christ, that is your hope now. D.A. Carson calls this life one that we need to be living with a view to the future. Let your gaze break through to eternity. To pray and lament as Asaph is to pray in fervent, expecting, messianic, Do you have an increasing, ever-increasing earnestness to see the return of the Messiah? Or are your prayers focused on the temporal, the situational? In the moments of chronic pain, death in the family, deep, dark, Sadness, let your gaze break through to eternity. Beloved, our hope is in Jesus Christ who is to come. The same yesterday, today, and forever. What do the content and attitude of your prayers reveal about what your hope is in when you lament? Do you live with a hopeful messianic expectation for the return of Jesus Christ? challenge for all of us for our prayer lives how often do we pray that the Lord would return soon come Lord Jesus come that is where our hope lies not just yet my stocks haven't fully developed my business isn't as far along as I'd like it to be I haven't gotten married yet that was me as an eight-year-old don't come yet, Jesus. I want to get married. I did. You can come now. Um, it's not a temporal hope. It's an eternal hope, a fervent hope, expecting, expecting the Messiah and his return. Do you pray for that? In closing, turn to Isaiah chapter 40 with me. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read the first 11 verses just as we close out. Israel's comfort and hope came 2,000 years ago in the form of Jesus Christ. Our hope and Israel's hope is that he is the fulfillment of Asaph's prayer for restoration, redemption, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of the revelation of Yahweh's glory. This is the hope we have. Isaiah 40, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. 
Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Beloved, the comfort of Israel is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The revelation of the glory of Yahweh in the incarnation. And he is coming again. That is the source of our fervent messianic expectation and hope. When you lament, when you are in deep sadness and grief, let your gaze break through to eternity at the, at the very fervent messianic hope that we have. The consolation and comfort of Israel is our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. Never take it for granted. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to your people. Your faithfulness in sending the Messiah, the one who restores, the one who is the comfort and consolation of Israel. The hope that we have is only in him. Lord, as we live our lives this week, in this new year, when we grieve, turn our minds back to the example of Asaph with a fervent messianic expectation in hope. Turn our minds to the hope we have in calling for the return of Jesus Christ. Father, be glorified in us this week as we proclaim your gospel, as we live out the light of your hope. It's in Jesus' name.